Thank you very much for this very generous introduction. And let me thank Professor Stanby, the chair of this department, and uh, David, uh, which I know for a long time, and all of you for inviting me to this, uh, this DTU chemistry lecture. I'm really honored with that, and I hope I don't disappoint you today talking about dynamic molecular systems. Um, we have a, a, a broad interest in half of my group is working in synthesis and catalysis, and the other half is working on switches and motors, which I'm going to discuss uh, uh, today. And uh, you might wonder why we have such an interest in, uh, in these systems. Let me go back in time a little bit, because you know what I'm going to talk today about is about designing molecules and molecular systems, but it's still very early days, like in those days where these gentlemen tried to fly with these primitive machines. And of course, for centuries, men tried to fly, and most of them killed themselves until these gentlemen came, the Wright brothers, and managed to fly a few yards, I think 32 yards. Uh, but what is most important is that people tried to copy and mimic, you know, the flying of the bird. At least we were fascinated by the birds that were flying. But you realize that this flying machine, the material is different, the flying principle is different. The plane does not flap his hands. I wouldn't have been to coming to Copenhagen, you know, if it would have been like that. The, whole, the basic principles are completely different. The materials are different, etc. And what is most important is you cannot predict where the field will go to, because nobody 100 years ago, this is only 100 years ago, would have predicted that, you know, in Switzerland last year, they were flying with this plane powered by solar cells. I couldn't fly from Amsterdam to Copenhagen yet with such a machine, but it does. We don't know what will happen in 50 years from now. So we are interested in, uh, in dynamic systems. And of course, we are very much inspired by modern nature, where you have these beautiful filaments in the cell, which are the highways in the cell. But unlike the highways here in Copenhagen, these are dynamic systems that are laid down and removed you know, on purpose when, when they are needed. You have these bio, bio nanomotors that are highly dynamic systems that transport or make your muscles moving. Of course, the catalytic systems like the rotary motor, which is a fantastic design that generates the ATP, ATP in your body or acts as a proton pump. The optical switching systems, which is the, the beautiful system that we, that the molecular system that we can see each other. And I will come back to these kind of systems. And of course, the membrane transporters, etc., the channels and so on, that bring things in and out of the cell. So just a few examples of these highly dynamic molecular systems that give us a lot of thought how to design systems to do similar kind of functions and then maybe useful applications, because at the end, we might want to make dynamic functions in soft materials, being it for information technology, so we'll add the next generation of nano information technology, or to drug delivery systems or sensors or new catalysts that assemble themselves, uh, smart materials for services and biomedical interfaces, uh, interfering with biological processes. This is going to be a hot topic, you know, in the coming decade. And of course, robotics that are based upon the materials that we can design in the lab. And we, of course, are not limited by what nature has given us in the sense of the materials, because the proteins and the DNA, and so once the stage had been set in evolution, you know, it went in that direction. But of course, as synthetic chemists, you know, being it inorganic materials or organic materials, being it polymers or small molecules, we can, of course, we have an unlimited possibility of designing new materials with all kinds of functions. But before I go to some examples to illustrate what I mean, is we have to realize when we go from molecules to molecular systems, these usually are complex multi-component assemblies that have certain functions. So it is the structure, of course, which is important. But beyond that, there is a lot more than only the molecule or the material, because it has to get a certain organization in the material. The function is important, but also the, how molecules come together you know, like in our cell, like the components in a simple, a simple assembly in the cell to make it multimolecular, to make things working. The interface is crucial. Often things happen in the interfaces. Think of the membranes, think of these filaments, you know. And then different hierarchical levels, being at the molecule, being at the supramolecular organization, being it at the mesoscopic or macromolecular level. So I'm a synthetic chemist. Basically, I'm a molecule builder, you know. I design new methods and molecules. 
But so synthesis is crucial because without molecules and materials you cannot do much. But of course the assembly, as I emphasize, the integration of structure and function is, is even uh, uh, is equally more uh, equally important. Then the dynamics, and I highlight this in red, because we do a lot of studies on dynamics, you know, with laser spectroscopy, time resolve, we do a lot of dynamics, you know, looking at catalysis, etc. But still, to control dynamics, you know, from scratch is still very difficult, and I will talk about that. And then we are extremely good in chemistry in equilibrium conditions, to find things under equilibrium conditions. But as we sit here, we are out of thermodynamic equilibrium. If we would be in thermodynamic equilibrium, we would be dead. So nature has learned how to get things out of thermodynamic equilibrium, and we are not that good in those things. So we have to find out how to assemble things and how to get systems working out of thermodynamic equilibrium driven by kinetic processes. And then, of course, autonomous processes, information systems, and catalysis. A lot of people working on this, of course, but to build it in a system is not that easy always. And then signal transduction, feedback loops, and repair mechanisms, and then replication and emerging and adaptive properties. These are fields, you know. I would encourage the young people here, you know, to look at this because there is e each of these you can make easily a scientific career, you know, for the rest of your life because these are tremendous problems out there, you know, where we have hardly any idea how to tackle that. So what I will do is I will talk about these molecular systems and focusing on dynamic functions. And in the first part of my talk, I would like to talk a little bit about molecular switches, how we can switch between two states, and, and on membrane transports and self-assembly. And then I will talk about motors, that is to say rotary motion and translational motion. And uh, when we talk about a switch, the most beautiful example is the switch in your eye. And it is basically a cis-trans isomerization around a carbon-carbon double bond, going from a cis-alkene to a trans-alkene. And we all learned this in school. We learned this in our undergraduate chemistry course. It is, it is absolutely marvelous and astonishing that nature has invented. And it's a very simple process, of course. Simply excitating a double bond, you rotate around the double bond, the change in the protein, and then yeah, the whole process starts. But of course, it has to be reversible because otherwise I would see you only once and you would see me only once and then it would be over. So the reversibility is crucial, of course, but we also should remind that the molecules we use for these processes in our body are not always the same molecules during the rest of our life. Of course, molecules are repaired all the time and replaced all the time. And I, I learned that 40% of the energy that goes in your body is used for repair mechanisms and replacements all the time. Now, with your computer chip, usually when something goes wrong with these switches, you know, in your computer chip, you take it out, you put it in a new chip, or you buy a new laptop, a new computer. But in, the, in your body, you cannot easily do that, so you have to replace and repair all the time. But anyway, building on these molecular switches, you can build in trigger functions. And we focus heavily on optical switches, and I will show you in a moment why. So when we go to the cell membrane, you know, and you uh, look at uh, what is in this cell membrane, we, we realize that in the cell membrane there are all these beautiful channels and pores uh, that help us to transport things in and out of the cell. And we thought, wouldn't it be nice if we could design a kind of a nano channel that we could command uh, uh, by an external signal using light, for instance. And we so together with our colleagues in the biochemistry department, we focused on the mechanosensitive channels of large conductivity, which are in the membrane of the colibacteria. So in your body, you know, there is a lot of colibacteria, and you can find this in the membranes. And this is a side view, and this is a top view. And you will realize that this is a pentamer. So it's four, five identical proteins that come together to form this complex. And normally, it's tightly closed. So it's like a diaphragma of a cell. It's tightly closed. And it can suddenly open. And when does it open? This is a pressure valve, like a pressure valve in a pressure cooker. So when the tension in the membrane builds up and in the cell and it starts to explode, or it, it, to prevent that, it suddenly opens a three to four nanometer pore and material flows out of the cell. So in a response to osmotic pressure, it can open. So we thought, can we make it light sensitive to engineer in a light switch to make it open and close with a non-invasive external signal? And so what we did is we went to the level of the genome. We modified it so that we could incorporate cysteine. So in each unit, there is a cysteine. So the, the dots here are the cysteines. And when you have a cysteine, 
you know you can hook up all kinds of things to the tile group of the cysteine. So we took a spiral pyran. When you have a spiral pyran, you can hook it up via a tile group here to this protein. And the idea was these spiral pyrans, they can open with UV light and close with visible light. That is to say, you go from this rigid spiral pyran structure to this open form, which has a switter ionic structure and a strong dipole. And they are strong hydrophilic. So the idea was when we engineered this constriction zone, five of these units, and we irradiate with light, will these dipoles repel? And will the water be attracted and pour into this, into this channel and open the channel, you know, with light? And indeed, when we put, after all this work, we put in these switches, we could switch, you know, as you can see here, we could switch with light, the protein. But that does not tell you, of course, if it opens or closes. It only tells you that the switch is there and you can switch with light. So what we had to do is to do a trick, and, and so we went to, uh, to vesicles, so we reconstituted this modified channel into a bilayer membrane, and inside the vesicle we put a self-quenching fluorescent dye, like calcine or so. And so there is all, you always have some leakage in these systems, you know, these vesicles are not these artificial systems are not always completely tight, so there's always background leakage. But you see here, after 18 minutes, we irradiate with UV light, the channel opens, and you get a burst of fluorescent material. We can quantify, actually, what goes out, and we can close it again, you know, by irradiating with visible light. So what we have done is the following. We have gone to the genome, we modified the protein complex, we built this channel, but now with these light switches incorporated, we can irradiate with light and we can open and close uh, the channel function uh, on command. And, uh, and then you can load in, in the vesicle material, like for instance a drug or a fluorescent compound, and it opens. And this is what you would call a kind of molecular device, an assembly of a discrete number of molecular components designed to achieve a specific function each molecular component performs a single act, while the entire supramolecular assembly performs a more complex function because they work together, according to the def definition by Vincenzo Balzani. So why are we doing this work? First of all, we wanted to prove that we could use light to do this kind of switching function at the nano level, but also we are looking towards controlled drug delivery. Of course, this is a hot issue, you know, to get drugs, you know, for instance, at, specifically at a tumor cell. And so we are hooking up now recognition units, you know, and to see if we can make these small capsules and then using them to open and deliver the drug. Also, we're changing the wavelength because we want to go away from the UV light. We want to go to the infrared light to have a higher penetration there. But this this is all ongoing, and we have designed in the meantime systems that are more advanced, but this is the principle. Now, the second switch I want to show you is this one here, where we have this central double bond connecting two halves, so-called overcrowded alkenes. And these molecules uh, are photo and electrochemically active, so you can switch with light and electrochemically yeah, by using a redox process. And I will use this also in the further part of my, further on in my study when I talk about molecular motors. The nice thing about this is that you can switch between different states. So these are relatively simple molecules, but they are extremely nice when you want to build new optoelectronic materials. So we use them for all kinds of purposes, but I will show you a few examples today. So we take this molecule, and due to the fact that this has steric hindrance here, this molecule is folded. So when you look along this axis, it has an anti-folded structure. This molecule can then be converted by light at 365 nanometers in a so-called syn-folded structure, and electrochemically you can oxidize it to the dication, and this dication is a twisted, 90 degrees twisted structure. Now it's not so easy to make molecules that have a 90 degree structure, you know? That already is nice for somebody who likes three-dimensional structures, but everything is reversible, as you can see. So you can switch back and forth between these three di different structures, depending upon the redox potential and about the wavelength of the light. Now, the nice thing is also you can follow the process, process precisely because this is blue fluorescent, this is red fluorescent, this is non-fluorescent. So we have three states that we can follow very easily, and we can use them for all kinds of purposes. For instance, you can assemble these molecules on surfaces, and you can make responsive surfaces. Uh, for instance, when you assemble them on gold, they are redox responsive or photo responsive, and you can change the wettability of surfaces and make monolayers. Uh, so these surfaces are covered with monolayers, and you make responsive materials in this way. 
But recently, we discovered this. And this is really cute, uh, taking this as a core unit for an amphiphile. So what we did is we took long hydrophilic and, and, and hydrophobic chains, so oligos and long alkyl chains. And they are, in the center is this aromatic core. And they form beautiful bilayers. And we reasoned that maybe due to this architecture, the pi system, they might stack. And the, and the, the, hydroph the hydrophobic alkyl chains might, might interact with each other strongly and to form bilayers. Now, how are we making these molecules? Uh, the key step, and, and I will use, I emphasize this because later on when I talk about motors, we use the same technology. To make such a hysterically crowded double bond is not easy. We tried every olefination reaction that you can find in the literature. But usually, they don't work very well. So what we do is old-fashioned Staudinger chemistry. So we take a hydrazone, we oxidize it in situ, you know, in this case by a periodo compound, but you can use also manganese. You oxidize it to a diazo compound, which is a very reactive species, of course. We, have, we convert the other half in the thio ketone. We do a 1,3 dipolar cycloaddition of a diazo and a thio ketone, extrude nitrogen, get the iposulfide, and then extrude sulfur to get the double bond. And that usually works fine in many cases. And why does it work? Because, you know, when you have two very reactive species, you do a 1-3 dipolar cycle addition, you generate a five-membered ring, then we do a ring contraction to a three-membered ring, and then a ring contraction to a two-membered ring, which is a double bond. So gradually, we enhance the steric hindrance in the system. That's the idea. And that works, thanks to Staudinger in the 30s. Uh, so we build these molecules, and then, uh, you realize that they can be switched, but we also figured out that with these amphiphilic molecules, when you irradiate at room temperature for a longer period, they are going to cyclize, and you get an extended aromatic rhombophore, which is highly fluorescent. So now we have four fluorescent states, and uh, what happens when we put them in water? This is what you see. You see this amphiphile forms fantastic nanotubes, micrometer long, exactly 28 nanometer in diameter, everyone uniform, no single exception. The wall is three nanometers, and when we add DOPC or an ordinary amphiphile that forms vesicles, you see they are end capped with vesicles. This wall is three nanometer, this is four nanometer. This is this stuff, this is this amphiphile. So this is probably the smallest reaction tube that you have ever seen in your life. Look at the dimensions. So why does it pack so well? You know, we think that this interdigitates. And when you do the calculations, you can see that they form a perfect interdigitated structure, maximizing Van der Waals interactions and forming these beautiful bilayers. So they are very stable. They are capped. And, and, and you, you can, we can make different caps, smaller caps, <coughs> larger caps. It depends all on the ratio, you know, that we add to that. But the nice thing is you can change the caps. So you, can, you have this supramolecular assembled nano object, and you can change the cap, as you can see, from a, a, a vesicle to, from a laminar to a cubic phase, for instance, by adding calcium chloride. Or you can take the cap off, remove it, and then put the cap on again. And the tubes stay intact. So there is a distinct difference in stability between these self-assembled objects. And that gives us the proposit pro pro possibility to, to put something inside these tubes or to take these vesicles, and you can, you know, you can put things in vesicles, like drugs or whatever, and then deliver them in the tubes. And we are now studying them in the context of delivering something in cells to use them as a kind of nano-injection needle for cells, you know, to put drugs into cells or something. You can do all kinds of games with it. So then what about? the photosensitivity, because I told you that the core is photosensitive. So what, what you see here is, is one, one tube. And you can follow nicely, you know, what happens, the decyclization reaction. And you can follow it uh, with fluorescence emission uh, spectroscopy very easily. Now, this is what happens. What, this is what you see when you follow it in real time. So this is now with wide field fluorescence. You can follow in real time. You see the tubes here. And when you irradiate in a matter of seconds or so, they completely disintegrate. But because we found that these cyclized compounds, when you do it at a proper wavelength, you get the cyclization of the core. And the cyclized compounds form tiny vesicles, not tubes anymore. So you can 
load something in the tubes, then you hit it with light, and within a matter of seconds, it completely disintegrates and it liberates the material. And you can follow it at the single tube level. Let me show you. Here is a single tube. Hopefully it works. This is a single tube. This is another one. And if the movie works, OK, you see it bending here. And you can follow the movement and the disintegration of a single nanotube. This is three nanometers in diameter. And we can follow the process precisely, you know, uh, at, at the nano scale. We can control it because what we did is we doped it with an amphiphilic doper, the tiny amount. And when you dope this in the cell wall, in the wall of this nanotube, you can control the energy transfer yeah, to your dye. And, and, and you can balance, you know, how much is cyclized in time. And you can, you can control, actually, the speed with which this disintegration of this banding uh, uh, takes place. So what we have done is we, we engineered these molecules that form these vesicle cap nanotubes. We can take the cap off or we can put it on again, but we can also disintegrate the whole system, you know, in, in real time if we can follow it us, using fluorescent uh, spectroscopy uh, when it opens up. So that illustrates two examples of how you can use light to control assembly and to control, you know, a gating, pore forming, opening at the nanoscale. But what I want to discuss in the coming half hour is uh, how to control motion. That is to say, rotary motion and translational motion. Now let's first make a step back to machines. And we all know what a machine is. And probably everybody here has seen once in some uh, a machine in a factory producing something like these robots in a car manufacturing plant. The, I'm always astonished how they can do this. You know, It's amazing. But then let's go down in scale a little bit to the nano level. And this is the ribosome in your body. And hopefully all these ribosomes are now very busy producing proteins, because they build the new proteins, of course, in your body. And I would argue that this machine here, this ribosome, is way more complex than any of these robots in a car manufacturing plant. And it will take us a while before we can build a robot that does this kind of function, you know? Although we learned a lot about that function and the dynamics in the last couple of years in biophysics. But what is important is, is the effect of length scale. You go from 2 meter to 24 nanometers. And that's an, a, a factor of almost a billion, you know, going to the nano scale, as we know. And the effect of length scales has a dramatic effect on when you look at the nano world, because here you will agree with me that gravity, inertia, mass, and size dictate to a large extent what is happening, you know, the gravity, you know, the weight of something, etc. But at the nano scale, Gravity and weight hardly plays or no role. It is the flexibility, the viscosity, the interactions, and the interface that are dominating. Of course, the van der Waals and the electrostatic interactions, etc. The viscosity of the medium, you know. This is what is dominating. So when you have to control motion, you have to realize that we live in a world at low Reynolds numbers, which is slightly different from the macro world, and that we, it's not so much a matter of how to get motion, but how to control motion, because there is tremendous motion at the nanoscale, being the Brownian motion, of course. And as uh, uh, Dean Astumian uh, or, and Fraser St of, uh, uh, George Whiteside say, at the nanoscale, it's you know, swimming in molecular molasses yeah, and fighting a Brownian storm. I mean, this is what you, ha what you are engaged in. So there is tremendous motion, and you have to get rid of this motion. So we know that if you go to, the, to mole molecules, you, you have motion in molecules, like, for instance, rotation around carbon-carbon single bonds. And we all know that this rotation is tremendously fast. Michael Cassia Cariba, a couple of years ago, made this rotor of an aerial group, a benzene group, connected to these single bonds here, which are connected to the acetylenes and then to the tripticines. This is freely rotating in solution, but also in the crystalline phase, because this is the crystal. So the solid phase, crystals. And it ro he measured that it rotates well over 100 megahertz, 100 million times per second. This is tremendous rotary motion. Of course, this is not a motor, because there is no directionality over the motion. It's simply uh, motion 
uh, uh, thermal motion. And, and people have made rotors, you know, like Joseph Mikkel. This is a beautiful example of a rotor on the surface. Again, there is no directional control. Of course, you have translational motion like Stoddard systems, AIDA systems, where they made kind of zipper systems, etc. So there is a whole community that works on rotors and, and, and machine-like functions, etc. But these are not motors. This is just thermal rota rotation, like the rotation, the conformational rotation around single bonds that we all learn in school. So a couple of years ago, we built this kind of molecule where we have a, a central carbon-carbon double bond, which is the axis of rotation. We have a propeller function, and we have a kind of a stator function. And you can see from the four colors here that this propeller rotates in a unidirectional sense uh, when we irradiate it with light. And what, how does this work? It's simple, uh, the same as with the switches and, and the irradiation, sorry, the photochemical process in our eye. The rotation around the carbon carbon double bond, you have to excite the carbon carbon double bond. You break the carbon carbon double bond temporarily, of course, eh, in the excited state. You can rotate, yeah, and then it goes, of course, down to the ground state again. So this process, and I will explain in a second how it works, why do we say this is a motor? Now, first of all, it shows rotary motion. But it distinguishes itself from rotors by the fact that we put in energy, and it has directional control, and it's repetitive. Think of the motor in your car. If there's no fuel in there, you wouldn't get anywhere. If there's equal probability of going backward and forward thermally, you wouldn't get anywhere either. And if you have not a continuous process or a repetitive process, it's a switch and not a motor. So this fulfills this criteria. And this is how it works. This is the stable form. You see this molecule, this is the X-ray structure, by the way. This molecule has a helical structure, the PP trans helicity. But it has also two stereo centers here, two methyl substituents, which are oriented in a pseudo-axial orientation. They are pointing away from the rest of the skeleton. And, and so this is relatively stable. But now, when you hit it with light, it starts to rotate the normal cis-trans isomerization. You change the helicity from p helicity to m helicity. You go from trans to cis. But most important, these two methyl substituents are now in a pseudo-equatorial orientation. And you can see already from this structure here that they are heavily crowded, steric hindrance, heavily crowded situation. So this molecule is not very stable. Although, in the photoequilibrium, we get about 90% of these and 10% of these. That all depends on the wavelength and so of course. But you get a highly crowded situation. So the molecule is very unhappy and wants to stabilize itself, and it does it by a helix inversion. So the two halves move along each other. And this is energetically downhill because the molecule wants to stabilize itself thermodynamically. So we get this molecule. And this is a unidirectional process under normal conditions. And why does it work so well? Because these methyl substituents, as you can see, due to this helix inversion, the methyl substituents are back in a pseudo-axial orientation, avoiding steric hindrance. So the molecule relaxes. Then you can hit it again with light. You can do a photoisomerization. You get, again, you do, in this case, you go from cis to trans. You invert the helicity. But most important, the molecules ha molecule have now the methyl substituents, again, in a very crowded situation. And the molecule wants to relax itself. And it does it by a helix inversion, going back to the original state. So we have four states, as you saw already before, with the four different colors. Two photochemical steps and two thermal steps make up a 360 degree unidirectional rotary cycle. When we start with one enantiomer, we go clockwise. When we start with the opposite enantiomer, we go counterclockwise. These steps are, of course, very fast. The photochemical step, we did femtosecond laser spectroscopy, and it's over in the picosecond domain. These steps are the thermal steps, and they are obviously slow. The first motor that we made had a rotary cycle once an hour. Now, that's not much of a motor, eh? and absolutely useless. But we were very lucky, because if it would have been very fast, we might have missed it, you know? 
because then we wouldn't have seen it. Now we could see each individual step and follow it by NMR and by circular diagrams spectroscopy because the helix invert takes place all the time and you can see it beautiful and I will show you an example in a second. So to summarize, this is the energy profile, energy versus rotation steps. And I show you here an example with the five membered ring, but this holds for all these motors. So you take the stable form, you put in the energy, the fuel from the light, it goes to the unstable cis, it wants to stabilize itself by helix inversion, you have the stable cis, you put in the energy again up from the light, it goes to the unstable trans and it stabilizes itself to go to stable trans. And that completes the 360 degree cycle. I put here a five membered ring because that helps to enhance the speed. This has a rotary cycle every three minutes. So this has already a dramatic increase. And why is this? Because we widen this gap here. So the helix inversion goes faster. You can imagine. We have to work on the thermal step. That's crucial. So to go to make motors, sorry, first of all, let me show you this. Because when I talked about this in the beginning, we also were worried a little bit. It doesn't look much like a motor that we know from the macro world, from our car. You know, because it goes with all this conformational, eh? it is not a smooth operation, you know. But then you realize that, of course, at a nanoscale in biology, in our body, it is different. Let me show you this once again. This is what our colleagues from the biology field, from Harvard, they made this movie. This is what happens in your cells. This is how the walkers walk over these actin filaments or the highways in your cell, and they transport things. And you can hardly believe that it works, you know? They step like this, you know? And your muscles, you know? When I saw these pictures, I could, because these are also the stepping motors, I couldn't believe that you can lift your arm, let alone that some guys, you know, can, can run 100 meters width in 10 seconds. But of course, you realize it is millions of these motors that work together to make your muscles moving, you know? So walking at the nanoscale means also working in concept. Many of these work together, you know, to do the job. But it's not at the nanoscale like the kind of motions, you know, that we know from, from our car. It's a lot of conformational motion, and that's important, of course, that there's all this conformational and vibrational motion, otherwise it would not work. So we, we also f uh, realized uh, uh, that uh, this is happening in nature because these guys published two years ago this paper where they unequivocally uh, assigned the directionality and the rotary motion in the rollups in the antenna system. So in the, in the opsin, you know, where it rotates by light around the carbon-carbon double bond, so the cis-trans isomerization, it turns out that it's the similar motor function. It rotates 360 degrees in a unidirectional sense. So it's all been invented already by the evolution, you know but evolution had a little head start. It, and also, we have less time than the billions of years, you know, in evolution. So we had to design new motors for the purpose of introducing function. I will show you in a moment why. So we made it, you know, for a synthetic chemist to build molecules that have identical halves, it's always a little bit annoying because if you do a reaction here, it happens also there. And so we wanted to get rid of that. So we have a stator part, we have an axle, and we have a rotor part, and we had to build these molecules and to figure out if they still would behave properly as motors. And indeed, you know, you make them enantiomatically pure, and now we go in this way. You nicely get a four-stage cycle, and you can see you can follow it nicely by CD. M helicity, P helicity, M, P, and back to M. So this is M helicity, P helicity, M helicity, P helicity, and then back to M. And it goes through this cycle, and we can do it many times using light. And if you irradiate with light continuously, it will rotate continuously. Now, one warning, because people always think you do, you can do this endless, but you realize that when you hit light on organic molecules, at a certain point, they are going to degrade, photo bleach or whatever. Anybody that tells me that they are endlessly stable, I don't believe that because there's always some side reactions and bleaching. On the other hand, we use these liquid crystal materials, which are organic molecules, in our laptops, you know, for ages, and our flat screens. And we use light emitting diodes, and they work per, per OLEDs work perfectly. So when you have the proper conditions, you stabilize them, etc. you can use them uh, uh, also in materials, etc. But you have to solve a few problems. So how to speed up? I mentioned already how we do this. You can make the design different. You can uh, 
work on the thermal properties of these systems, and we have made a whole range of motors. Now, the fastest one we have now is 3.3 .3 megahertz. So we are now in the nanosecond regime. So we do kinetics, you know, in, uh, uh, by measuring at very low temperatures, for instance, cryo measurements at very low temperatures, or we do a transient spectroscopy to measure, you know, how fast these systems are. But this is where we are. So this is the photoisomerization uh, rate, and this is the maximum rotate in the thermal step that we have, so 3.3 .3 million times per second. That we could prove. I think we have faster ones, but we are not able to prove that they are still unidirectional, which is, of course, a requirement. Uh, that does not mean that they rotate at 3.3 .3 megahertz. Eh? Let me give a small warning here as well. This is theoretical, but it all depends upon the wavelength, the amount of light, the quantum yield, the conditions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we calculated that at best we have about 4,000 rotations per minute in the best system. But that's also pretty good. So we have now systems that have half-lives of an hour, of minutes, of microseconds, et cetera. So then people ask me, can you rotate in the opposite direction? Now, in your car, you can Yes, which in the back here. In, with molecules, what I could do is take the opposite enantiomer, yeah, and then rotate in opposite direction. But that, of course, is not what you do with your car. You don't put in a motor, a different motor that rotates in the opposite direction. So we, we had to think about it. And this, as, as David said, you know, I like stereochemistry, and this took me a while to figure out with my students how to do this. How can you switch a molecule that goes in one direction, switch it to go in the opposite direction? Now, of course, you have, obviously, you have to change helicity at some stage. So what we did is, you know the stereo center here that I just showed you, this methyl substituent, was quite crucial eh, in determining the directionality, eh, going from axial to equatorial. So what we did is, we took the stereo center away from here to there. And the reason was, we wanted to deprotonate, to deprotonate, to do an inversion of the stereochemistry at this center. And for that, we needed a carbonyl, because then you can deprotonate via the enolate form. But if you do it at this position, you generate an anion, which is in conjugation with the double bond, and you shift the double bond, and you, your excess is gone of your motor. So we moved it up here, and now we can irradiate, and we go to the unstable form, and then we can continue in this cycle, which is the clockwise cycle. But every time when we are in the unstable form, we can add base, and we can do an epimerization to go from this orientation to this orientation. And what happens in the unstable form when we do an epimerization, the molecule immediately does the flip because it wants to stabilize itself. So now we have the opposite enantiomer, and we go in the counterclockwise direction. So we can go from clockwise, and we can go to counterclockwise mode. And that works, not perfect, of course, but we show the principle. I don't have to build it in a car. I just wanted to show a principle. But we can go in a clockwise manner. We can do an epimerization. We go in a counterclockwise manner. And again, CD spectroscopy and NMR helped us a lot to show that. Now, so we solved that problem. So very briefly, something that we published also recently, and that is, can you do something useful with such a motor, you know? And people ask me that also. And we thought, as we do catalysis, and organocatalysis is a hot topic these days, we thought, why not making a catalyst that can change, you know, upon command? So we put in catalytic functions A and B, and the whole idea was, when you are in this transform, the two catalytic functions are far apart. And then when you rotate, you bring them together, yeah? And you generate a certain elicity, and then you can change the chirality again. So the idea was to make a catalyst that has at least three states where you have them far apart, where you have m elicity and they are close, and you have p elicity and they are close. So we build in this amine group, the DMAP group, which is a well-known organic catalyst, of course, a base, and a thiourea group. And to build this kind of catalyst that are multifunctional. And for that, we took advantage of people like Eric Jacobson and, and people in the organic community, you know, like Karl Anke Jurgensen here in Aarhus, who does a lot of organic, he's very famous for organic catalysis. So you can take advantage of the, the knowledge. So thiureas and amines, we put them in here. And after some synthetic work, we designed this molecule in enzymatically pure. So the core is a motor, and you have these catalytic groups. And now the question is, will they work? 
So first of all, what we did is we took this compound and we irradiate with light and we get, yes, we bring the groups together and then we could do an isomerization. It doesn't work perfect, but we can see that it goes from this state to this state to this state and then back. There is a fourth state, as you can imagine, but we don't use them because it's only stable at minus 10 degrees. So you cannot probably use it as a catalyst. So we have three states and we switch between the three states in a cycle. And as a reaction, we took a simple reaction which was pioneered by Hans Winberg, I think well over 30 years ago. He was a pioneer in organocatalysis. And he studied together with Henk Himsla, who is now at the University of Amsterdam, he studied the tile addition to cyclohexanone. A very simple reaction. And you see when we have the trans, we get very slow conversion. It is catalytically active. The groups are far apart. They don't cooperate. But you get racemate, equal amounts of RNS. As you can imagine, the chirality is not really felt by the catalyst. Then you bring them together by irradiating with light. And you see you speed up the catalysis. And you get a preference for the S and enantiomer. Then you go in the next step. You speed up again. And you get the R and enantiomer. So, by taking this system, you can, we can use now light to bring the groups together and control if the approach is from the C phase or the re phase in this asymmetric catalysis. And when we will build models, it seems to fit quite nicely. So this is what we have. We have a multitasking catalyst. That is to say, they can build racemate. You can make preferentially one enantiomer or preferentially the other enantiomer. Now, you might say, this is not 99% E. Not even 90%. But that was not our goal. I can tell you that we, in our other programs, we can make catalysts that get very high E's. But that was not our goal. Our goal was to make a catalyst that we could make a resume, one enantiomer and the other enantiomer, on command. And we can go in a cycle, eh? because we can go from here to there to there and then back to the original state. And when we go in a right-handed cycle, we first make the resume, done the R, and done the S. But when we go in a left-handed cycle, we start with the resume, then we make the S first, and then the R. So this is the stepping stone, and there are four people in my group working on this now, the stepping stone to multitasking catalysts. So catalysts that we can address with an outside signal and that can do sequentially multiple tasks. Like in, our, in, the, in the natural system, you know, where the intermediates are not isolated. Eh? There are no gammas there that are there, you know, isolating the compound. No, they are transferred from one enzyme to the other, and you get these cascades of reactions. So this is what we hope to engineer in the, in the near future. Um, so let me then show you something of control of functions. And we assemble molecules on surfaces because it's very important that you have molecules that do something in solution. But when you really want to build nanotechnology, it's very important you know, to work on the hard, soft interface, to engineer something you know, that you can interface with the macro world. We work at the mesoscopic level, at the polymers. I will not discuss those. But let me show you briefly how we put them on surfaces. So we, we put to the stato, we put legs. And uh, originally, we started with tile groups connected to the lower half. And we assembled them on gold, and it worked fine. Why two legs? Because if you have one leg, you know the whole thing starts to spin. Eh? And we want to have two legs so that they are firmly standing. And they still should have enough flexibility so that you can, can move. When we had the tile groups directly on the motor and we put them on surfaces, they didn't work at all. And we should have known that because the physics community could have told us immediately, when you come with your excited state too close to the Fermi level of the gold, then it's all over because they cross and you quench your photochemistry. So we put in a little bit of grease, slightly longer legs, lift them from the surface, and it works beautiful. So we can make these monolayers and they spin you know, on gold and other surfaces. And so this is our way how we do this. We, we build these types of motors with different orientations of the axis. We assemble them on quartz, on gold, on different surfaces, and we can rotate them in a unidirectional uh, sense. So azimutal, disorientation, and altitudinal is disorientation. Now, <laughs> so here is an example just to show you that it's not only cartoons. But we can build them, for instance, on five nanometer gold. We self-assemble with tile groups, and we rotate. And we can follow the rotatory cycle. You know, These are tricky experiments to measure because these are monolayers. But it works, and we can follow it even with CD spectroscopy. We can put them also on, uh, on silica or quartz. 
using a click chemistry. This is really beautiful. I can recommend this because in recent years we have done a lot of work on this click chemistry. Azides on gold are on the surface and acetylenes on the molecule that you want to attach or the other way around. And then you can click them and you, the nice thing is that we can easily see if it's there because with XPS you can follow if it's a triazole or if it's a azide. And of course it's always the question if you assemble molecules on surfaces, is the molecule there and how is it attached? And with XPS you can really nicely follow this. So with that in hand we have these systems now. So this is where we stand. You know, we have a whole collection of molecules where we build monolayers of these spinning objects on surfaces. And uh, you might wonder, you know, uh, where we stand. Now, I take this picture here from Holland. You, have, you probably recognize this because you have a lot of windmills here in, in Denmark, I know. But the, these, the, 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 these guys 500 years ago were way smarter than we are because they were able to put them on a dike and to pump the water out of our polders to make it possible that we could live in Amsterdam and so we forced 40% of our countries below sea level, as you know, and they use these windmills to, to get, get, keep our feet dry. And we might use them again in the, in, the, in the future, you know, when our sea level is going to rise, I don't know. But, the, but they were smart in the sense that they could put them on the dike and use them as pumps. So we know now how to assemble them on surfaces. The difference in size is about one billion, yeah? Slight difference. But we have no idea yet how to put them on dikes. So we are now building nano dikes or sub-micro dikes and to see if we can make kind of nano valves and so to do really micro pumping and sub-micro pumping and so maybe in micro channels and so. So this is the next challenge for us. So we had also thought about liquid crystals. And liquid crystals are beautiful materials. You all know it from your iPhone and from your laptop, etc. these soft materials. These are rod-like molecules and they, they organize like beams in a river. But when you dope them with chiral materials, you get this helical organization. Eh? And, and the helix here, is, is the chirality is crucial for the colored pixel that you get in your liquid crystal material. Because if you have a long helix, the black reflection of the light, you get red reflection. If you have a short helix, you get blue, a blue spot. Now what we did is, we doped them with a gyro motor, one weight percent, and the idea was when you dope them with this motor, then you get a helical organization, hopefully, because they are very good dopants for liquid crystals. And maybe then when we hit them with light, we can make color pixels, and we don't need the electrodes anymore. And it works beautiful. You can see here, this is, this is just taken from the microscope. We hit it with light, and we can make color pixels, you know, in a matter of minutes. Just by hitting, the helicity changes, the helix unwinds or winds, and you get different reflection of the light. So this is how we make thin films of responsive materials where we can change the color. And you can think about using them for sensing and all kinds of applications. Liquid crystals are really beautiful materials, of course, and we know that because we use them every day. So then we figured out that when you have the liquid crystal material, in your laptop, it's always covered by a glass plate. But when you push in it, the soft material is behind it. Eh? And don't push too hard, eh? because you destroy your screen. When the soft material is at the interface with air, you will see this. With tapping mode AFM, you see a corrugated surface. You see like waves on the sea. It's, it's, it's not planar. And that is due to the orientation of these rod-like molecules at the air-liquid crystal interface. The helix axis is along the interface. And we found out that we could use this because if you now look under the microscope at this thin film of the liquid material, you see here the, the fingerprint texture. These are these waves that I just showed you. And we put a glass rod on top of it. This is the dimensions, micrometer dimensions. It should not be too heavy. It should so be, this is a micrometer thick layer. And we put this glass rod like a tiny boat on top of this layer. The motor you don't see because there's only 1% and it's only one nanometer. But this is what, you happen, what happens now when you hit it with light. And this is directly taken from the microscope. By, you switch on the lamp, the proper wavelength, you see the color changing, you see the surface architecture changing, so the waves change, and you see the object spinning in a clockwise direction. We can spin it clockwise, we can spin it counterclockwise. It all depends upon the motor function. 
So the only thing we do is, with the light, that you change the helicity, it transmits the causality change through the orientation in the liquid crystal. It changes the surface tension, it changes the color, the pixels, and it can spin an object on top of it. It should not be too heavy, of course, because otherwise it sticks and you see only waves, but it can move an object. We can even uh, do this with droplets. This is fairly recent results, which is a publication is upcoming now. These are micro droplets, and I know there is a lot of interest in droplets in engineering as well, you know, to make micro droplets and to do reactions in micro droplets or separation. This is how we change droplets, the architecture in a droplet and the orientation in such droplets. And you can see it's a very nice dynamic system. So what happens is that you uh, probably unwind or wind the helical organization, and that changes surface tension, and that induces this effect. So it's an amplification. Of course, at the scale of one motor, it's nothing. The forces is in the piconucleton. But if you go to collective action, you see you can amplify the effects quite dramatically and do even useful functions. So in the last 10 minutes, if the chairman allows me, I would like to show you how you can move something. That is to say, translational movement. Because uh, that was another nice challenge, you know, how to move something. And I will show you how we do this electrically and chemically. So first, this one. People, again, they challenged us a lot by saying, look, you have these nice motors and switches, but once in your body, are you ever able to transport something or so? Because this is what people dream about, eh? to make a kind of submarine that goes through your blood veins and delivers a drug or does a repair on your cells or whatever. And of course, with light, it's a bit difficult. Although these surgeons these days, they, they go with lasers in your body and they can do all kinds of fancy things. But we thought we need a chemical driven system, you know? So what is the fuel there? So we thought, okay, may, maybe we should take sugar because there's plenty of sugar in your body. Can we drive something autonomously with sugar as a fuel? So we designed this system. We took a carbon nanotube. And a carbon nanotubes, you can oxidize this. This is well known in the literature. You put on carboxylic acid groups, the carbon nanotubes become water soluble. And now we hook up via amide bonds to the carboxylic acid enzymes. In this case, a catalase enzyme, which converts hydrogen peroxide into oxygen and water. Why catalase? Because it's a tremendously active enzyme. It's very robust. And why is it in nature? Because I love this enzyme because it decomposes hydrogen peroxide. It's very clean and it's very active, high turnover numbers. You don't want to have hydrogen peroxide in a natural system because you generate hydroxyl radicals and hydroxyl radicals are involved in the process of aging, of course. So nature wants to get rid of that. So decomposition of hydrogen peroxide is very important. So we thought, how can we generate hydrogen peroxide? And you can do it using glucose oxidase. So glucose, sugar is converted into a glucuronic acid and hydrogen peroxide. Now, it took us a while before we had all the, co we had the connections right, we had the activity right. You need a nine to one ratio, but you need more glucose oxidase than catalase. But then they have to do something new. So the system has to come together and they have now to work in concert to get propulsion. This is the nanotube that we built. And you see the enzymes, this is electron microscopy, this is after staining. So you see the enzymes are covalently attached to the nanotube. And this is what you see. So you might see one nanotube moving, and that is not good. I cannot do that yet, because these nanotubes have the tendency to aggregate. And certainly when these enzymes are there, these proteins, the big proteins, they start to aggregate. But uh, we have to solve that problem. But this is our primitive effort. So again, what you see here is a thin film of water with these aggregates of nanotubes. You see black dots here. This is the oxygen coming out. And I inject sugar, glucose. And, and these are, this is all stuck here, you know. There are many nanotubes that are not functionalized. They are simply there. Others are functionalized, but they form big aggregates. But look here. This is what we see when we inject glucose. And I don't touch it. It only autonomously moves on glucose as a fuel. And as long as there is glucose, they move. And when the glucose is depleted, they stop. You can add new glucose, new gl glucose and they add again. Oxygen is bubbling out. It's kind of like a propulsion uh, system based on oxygen. Now, you might wonder, can you, can you move something in your, 
your body then in a blood vein or so. Now, you, you agree this is just the first primitive steps. It will be a long time. But think about it 50 years from now. I'm convinced, you know, that once we under, get the underlying principles right, you might make this kind of submarines, not this design, but different ones, that catalytically can be propelled and out of the dimensions that you can inject in your blood vein and go to a tumor cell and detect it or deliver something, etc. I'm sure it will come. It might take a lot of engineering at the molecular level, at the nano level, but it, it will probably work. So the second and final example is how we can move something on the surface. And, and of course, there are the designs by Joachim, who took a molecule and he pushed it with the tip of an STM. So you push it along an edge, you know, of molecules. Or James Tour, I'm probably you have seen this, with his uh, C60s, with a frame. He mentioned this as a nano car, but it's a kind of a wagon, eh? It's not a car. I mean, it's a wagon. You have to push it, of course. He pushes it or drags it over the surface. Uh, we thought we should do it different. We should make something that moves autonomously when you fuel it. And in this case, we designed something because with, with our motors. Because we have these rotating motors, and we know that they can be fueled both electrochemically and photochemically. So we made a frame. We built in four of these motors. And you know that this motor has a propeller unit. And you go to double bond isomerizations and helix inversions, a four-stage cycle. So the difference here is that we have a four-wheel drive at the nano scale with an intrinsic motor function, cooperative action, hopefully, electrically powered and control of directionality. Now, it honestly, it took us two years to build the molecule with four people. You know, it was not easy. It was a total synthesis which was not easy. You have to make it enantiomatically pure, eh? and it should work. And so here is the design. And I, this is the STM picture. You see here the, the, the system. This is a single motor, a uh, nanocar, sorry. This is the, what, what the model tells us. And I think this is very important to realize that due to these rotating wheels, the whole molecule is lifted a bit from the surface. Because when you are on the surface, and this is a copper surface at low temperature, when you have a big aromatic molecule, and you put it on the surface, what happens is it will stick there, and you will never get it moving unless you drag it or push it. But when it is too loosely bound, it will fly in all directions, of course. So the crucial thing is to get a balance right, but I think we had to lift it a little bit, you know, otherwise it would have never worked. And that was the advantage of having these four wheels. So what we do is we build this system with the exterior chemistry was RSRS, so a mesoisomer, we excite it with the STM tip, and we see if we can move it. By doing helix inversions or double bond isomerizations, it all depends upon the energy we put in it. So initially, we could do multiple helix inversions by fueling it at around 200 millivolts. What we see is we indeed see helix inversions, but we never see any movement. Because we see some thermal isomerization, some vibrational isomerization, but we don't see a rotary cycle. But then, when we hit it at a slightly higher voltage, this is what you see. So it starts to move yeah, by pulsing it, and you can follow it by STM. So this is the trajectory we see here. After 40 positions, you see a quite a random position, a random trajectory. But then we change the orientation of the wheels. So this was, again, a tough design, because we had to make the design so that the wheels rotate in the same direction. And now we see it moving in much more a linear fashion. So this is the trajectory you can follow. You know, and we pulse it at 500 millivolts. And it goes, as far as we can tell, it goes through this rotary, rotary cycle. So this is an interesting exercise in stereochemistry. Because I don't know if you realize, when you are in your car, and you are behind the steering wheel. This, uh, this wheel in front of you moves counterclockwise, and this moves clockwise. If they would move in the same direction, wise, both clockwise or counterclockwise, then it would do this. Eh? It would never go like this. And so this is what we have seen. We have seen that they move in a more or less linear, not perfect, of course, more or less linear. They stop or they move around the corner, and you get this random type of motion. And we have seen all these three types of motion in our systems. So this is what we have seen, this kind of trajectories. It stops, more random and more linear motion, designing 
the molecule with different stereochemistries in the wheels working in cooperation. And the way it moves is, we think it's like this. It does this kind of stepping kind of move. So don't compare it with your car, eh, please. It's the stepping kind of motion, you know. It's conformational and configurational changes. So that brings me to my conclusions. Uh, you know, I showed you with these very primitive motor functions and switch functions that we can control with light. Oops. Chemically and electrically, we get motion, rotary motion and translational motion. And once again, you realize this is extremely primitive because to get directionality, to go from A to B, to transport things, you know, to position things on the line, all these things are currently under investigation, which is another major challenge because we have to do the surface science right, et cetera, et cetera. But the, we know motion can be done. And so this is where we stand. But of course, the challenges are tremendous. And the perspectives are very nice, because if we are able to get repetitive and directional movement, we can maybe sample this cooperative action and then see if we can go along trajectories. And we can use it to generate biohybrid systems, as I showed you with these channel proteins, you know. But imagine that you put these motor functions in your proteins or in the replication machinery, you know, or what we currently do in heart functions, to control heart functions, you know, of heart cells. Of course, integrating functions with transporters and pumps and adaptive materials with adaptive properties, moving along gradients, roofing sensors to, to find, say, for instance, a tumor cell, or making artificial muscles, muscles multitasking catalyst, or delivery system. There's a lot of options out there, you know, where we can work on, you know, with a certain complexity, I agree. But with that, with these challenges there and summarizing this, I would like to finish, but not before I think the people that worked in my group in the past and are currently working, of course, the people that I cooperate with both in Groningen and in other departments. Because you can imagine, uh, sometimes I need a clean room. I team up with the physics people. I team up with the, uh, with the biologists, you know, to work on the DNA and on the proteins, etc. Several of these projects you have to to uh, cooperate with, with other, other people, but at the end it works out very nicely. The funding agencies, and again, let me emphasize, you know, my ancestors, you know, which were a great source of inspiration with these windmills in Holland to make it possible that we can make this nanoscale windmill park now powered by solar light. Thanks again to my students. I would not be able to tell anything, wasn't it, for their talent, their skills, and their hard work in the laboratories. I own a lot to them. And I want to thank the staff here, you know, for inviting me here to be a lecturer today here and for the hospitality. I greatly enjoy to be in this fine department here today. Thank you so much. Uh, if you don't know where we are, uh, this is Holland. This is Denmark. And we are there in the north. And if you ever come to us, I forgot to show it. This is our old academy building, you know, which is, which is where we have all our PhD ceremonies. Thanks, David. Okay, so uh, thank you for a very fascinating journey, I would say, uh, in the nano world. So any questions or comments from the audience? Yes. The, uh, we did uh, quantum yield, uh, uh, that all depends upon the different motors that we make, the different functionalities. You know with photoactive molecules, you change one substituent and the quantum yield can go up or down dramatically. So usually the quantum yield, the best quantum yields is around 20, 0 0.2, 0 0.25 or so. Um, so, and uh, we have also systems that's only one or two percent. It all depends. The efficiency, of course, energy efficiency wise is not very high, you know, it's, it's very low, less than a percent or so I would say, but you really would make a system. But I've not really looked seriously in making a device and looking at efficiency. I would nobody uh, advise you to, cope with, to buy a share in my energy company, you know, on, <laughs> on nano windmills, you know, it's much better to invest in solar cells or in your own windmills. 
But that is not my purpose at this moment. You know, we, of course, wanted to, and hopefully I demonstrated this, to work on the fundamental principles. How can you get a rotary motor? How can you move something with respect to a surface to the outside world? Because we can change now properties and surfaces. How can you, how can you move something along a surface that it doesn't fly in all directions and to get some directionality or to propel it by a chemical fuel, as I showed you? Now, <laughs> the major problems come because to bring it to really to some technology, et cetera. On the other hand, we are building these in, as you see, in proteins. And uh, we have now built in some of these motor functions in proteins, connecting it to oligonucleotides, and we are controlling replication. We're trying now, at least. We have some primitive, uh, sorry, some preliminary results to control replication processes, so cell replication. And you can imagine, you can set it on and off in this way. And I mentioned heart function to make a nano, you know, uh, how do you call it, uh, pacemaker. This is, it's just a challenge. I don't know if it will work ultimately, but the first, we see the first glimpse that it will work, that you can control the heart cell function through such stimulus that you put externally. And if you then irradiate with infrared light, I mean, it's extremely simple. So I, I see tremendous opportunities there. But realistically, we are still at a very fundamental level. This is why I started with the Wright brothers today. <laughs> yes, please. I think uh, inspired also by nature, and I think in some cases with your uh, switchable kind of catalyst, for example, it actually surpasses nature because you can control which natural yeah, yeah. Yeah. elements can actually do that. Um, I have a question about your, your motors and technical question. So you can switch from the phenyl to the naphthol and that gave you a faster turnover. The methyl group, can you put in something bigger? Yeah, there, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we have put all kinds of substituents. You can, we, we have put auto tertiary butyls, and we get tremendously enhancement of the speed because it all depends upon the pathway, the step, you know, the isomerization step. So yes, we could enhance it with a factor of 1,000 or so. And as I mentioned, we, we have isomerizations that are so fast that we can, we, we, but we don't know if they are unidirectional because we cannot prove it. We cannot do the CD measurements anymore. So you want to have, I want to make sure, if I call it a motor, I want to be sure that it's unidirectional. I know that the isomerize faster. We can do the, 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 the uh, how do you call it, the uh, transient spectroscopy on it. That works. But that doesn't tell us if it's unidirectional, at, at least as far as we tell. With respect to the functions, yes, the nice thing is, of course, if you can go beyond functions that nature cannot do, like with the catalyst. Because an enzyme, I don't know of an enzyme that can make a racemate one and enzymer in the other. So again, it's not so interesting to make a resume. But the interesting thing is, can you change the behavior of your catalyst stepwise? And you make compound A, then you switch, the catalyst does a different function, and then the catalyst does a different function. That is what intrigues me, you know? And that hopefully will work with these dynamic systems. So follow-up question, in terms of translating, I'm sure people can help translate into motion. Yes. Yeah. Could you imagine that moving on a charge surface? Yeah. I, I, we have a number of designs, and I like this uh, very much. This uh, is a great, uh, great idea. To make what we are currently doing is to make patterned surfaces. So we build roads on surfaces. So monolayers, there's a lot of information on monolayers formation on surfaces. So to assemble monolayers with specific interactions. So charges, hydrogen bonds, uh, etc and to see if we can make steps over the surface. It's, it's tough, it's challenging, because your parts, your pathway should be correct, and they should assemble well, not too much defects. That's, I mean, people show these beautiful pictures of self-assembled surfaces, but then you see a lot of defects if you lower the larger area. So that's not that, e but, but it, it will work. Ultimately, I'm convinced it will work. So we use these approaches to make pathways and to see if we can use the, say, electrostatic interactions to move things step by step by step. And I think at the end, uh, yeah, it, it will work, but it, it takes a little bit of time to get it properly done. Uh, we also look at other functions, like for instance, to build long arms. We are just about to write a paper where we have built long arms, you know, very long arms. You extend the arms. What will happen when you go through a solution? 
does it move slower? And at what point, you know, and do you have this drag solution? So this mechanics in solution at the nanoscale, it's not that much understood, you know? So we are trying to figure that out. So yes, these are the interesting questions. How much interaction do you need? Or can you afford? Yes, please. Yeah. Is it important to, to time these processes? No. Just bathe them in photons? Yeah. Yeah, because you know the photochemical process is in equilibrium, yeah? But every time you are in the unstable form, it can do an helix inversion. Of course, it also, if you irradiate continuously, it can also go back. But as long as you have a netto forward isomerization, it will go in this direction, you know? And we measured that. We have done a lot of uh, measurements, you know, to see how many molecules then go in a forward direction, you know, when you are under those conditions. No, the question, the question is, is the forward reaction fast enough, you know, and you drive them out of equilibrium? Because that's in fact what you do, eh? It's just like a chemical reaction. You take away one product all the time, and you drive the equilibrium. Yes, please. Say, say that the first thing again. If you build the windows, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a this is a very important point. We, yeah, we have experienced that in some cases where we assemble them on surfaces and they that again depends upon where the legs are and what the nature of the motor is. But when they come too close, we have seen several examples where the isomerization slows down a lot and also the quantum yield, you know, because you get quenching effects, etc. So yes, you get these effects. You can circumvent that by diluting, by putting a little bit of alkyl tails in between, you know, so that you create more or less like a solution environment. But you don't want to dilute too much because then you cannot measure anymore. But yes, in some cases they simply like cockwheels, you know, and apparently then they stick. These are interesting phenomena, you know, how, di how dynamic and how close can you pack things on surfaces, yes. Yes. Did you think about using your chiral plants for doing chiral separation? <laughs> It's a very, uh, very, that's, as a stereo chemist, you know, I would love to do that experiment. Uh, we do chiral separations with a lot of things like you do in the laboratories here, which are much simpler than building a nano car and to do the separation. But just for fun, it would be cool eh, to see if it could be done. Um, I don't know. I don't know if it is uh, possible. What we try to do and failed miserably is to build a racemic nano car and to see if one would drive to the right and one would drive to the left. That's also a guile separation. So far, it didn't work properly <laughs> yet. I don't know how to do it. But yes, the next step, of course, is, and there's one of my PhD students working on that. He doesn't make built cars, but he makes dragsters, dragsters, because we realize you don't need four wheels that are driven. You need only two, yeah? Two, and you have a kind of a dragster, yeah? And you have two wheels that are not powered. And then we build in the middle, in the frame, we build all kinds of recognition units so that we can bind, indeed, all kinds of organic molecules like uh, amino acids. And so hopefully in the coming years, we will be able to do these experiments exactly, yeah, that you get, that it picks up selectively, yeah, one, and then you can. But I don't know if we use the car function for separation. We are more interested in the transport function, you know, to see if we can pick up something, it transports, and then delivers again. But it would be cool to do so, yeah. In principle, in principle, yes, why not? I have a follow-up question that you showed one assistant from another group, the tools group was made this yeah. way to the wagon, which you have to pull or push. Can you hook that up to your uh, Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a cool one. That is that is to make a kind of a nano train, eh? Yeah, that's, that's what my students dream of also, to build, to use it as a kind of locomotive and then to, to pull a, a few uh, yeah, units behind. So what, the stage where they are now is they build dragsters with a small frame and then they put things at the end. 
And we are now at, like, for instance, fluorescent groups or big aromatic groups or other things. And they have made a, designed three of these systems now. And the first results on the STM pixels are there. So we can see the molecules, but the control is still meager. So we have to figure out how to do that. You know, because we have to do STM experiments and then irradiate with the laser, yeah, and to follow them step by step. And under ordinary conditions, yeah, we don't want to go to low temperatures and so. It's a bit tricky setup and so. So we have to figure out how to do exactly, you know, the measurements and so, and then the statistics and if it all works properly. But yes, that's exactly what we do to hook up things and to see yeah, if you could. And you could think of hooking up things that you could cleave up with a chemical reaction or even photochemically, but then of course you have to disconnect the photochemistry of your motor function from the photochemistry of your uh, cleavage reaction. But basically, all these tools are around there. The only question is how we can get them integrated and then it should still function. The individual things are there, I think. But you know uh, equally well that I know, we had bad experiences that you thought, okay, you design a molecule with two or three different functions and suddenly it, the whole thing doesn't work anymore because you get energy transfer or electron transfer or it quenching effects or whatever and it doesn't work anymore because you make it eh, coming too close together. Sometimes you have to separate. There's a lot of speed bumps, yes. But that makes it interesting. Any questions or comments? If not, then let's thank Professor Fiat once again.